Um, my work in the com field of compulsive sexuality started in a residential treatment center in Los Angeles with a man by the name of Pat Carnes who was, who wrote out of the shadows. Dr. Carnes is sort of the seminal figure in sex addiction work and, but one of the things we found out working in a residential or inpatient facility fairly quickly is that you can't treat sex addicts without offenders coming in the door. Um, and I will make a definition in a moment between someone who's a sex addict and someone who's an offender, but the reality is, is that someone come in, can come into treatment because their wife found out that they were seeing prostitutes and involved with a lot of online porn, and then during the course of intensive work with them over a period of time, you can find out, oh, gee, they just forgot to tell you or didn't mention or were too ashamed to say that they also exhibited themselves at one time or they also, um, engaged in uh, you know, uh, drug-related sexual behavior, like uh, having sex with someone when they were intoxicated. So this kind of thing can come out during the course of other treatment. It can come out in CD treatment too, right? You can be treated for, some, for chemical dependency and all of a sudden realize, wow, that, that, that behavior they're describing that they have the most shame over, that's the thing that they say that they've been using over, th that's a sexual offense. What do we do with that? So I just wanted to, uh, say how I got to this piece of it. Um, and now that I run a clinic for outpatient sexual disorders, um, no, the disorders aren't outpatient sexual disorders. We run an outpatient clinic for sexual disorders. Um, we get offenders who come into treatment. So um, very quickly, I just want to ask, um, does any, do you guys work with offenders? Is it, okay, is this in your own settings or? I, I work for corrections. Corrections, okay. Okay, in what kind of setting? It's a group, it's outpatient. Okay. But there are, it's usually PMP. Okay, others? Okay, in a private practice setting? Okay, um, and do you work specifically with offenders? Do they just come in sometimes, or you just wanna learn more about it? Okay, well then I'm probably gonna really bore you, and maybe we can, because I really, my goal in this is to try to help people understand about offending. Did either of you or any of the three of you have formal education in the treatment of offenders? I mean, was it a part of your education in grad school or? Okay. No, just got lucky. Well, you know, I say hate the behavior, but don't hate the person, you know? And I've had interns who came in and said, you know, Rob, I'll work with you around the sex addiction, but I don't ever want to work with an offender. And then they're working with a sex addict and they really get involved with them and start to like them and really cheer for their recovery and get to know their family and do couples work. And then six months into it, they find out that the person was engaging in offending behavior and all of a sudden, the person said, I never want to work with an offender, is working with an offender, but they haven't all along. And I think that just sort of speaks to the misconception and fear about the issues. So I, I, in whatever way I can, I just want to put out an overview. Um, I, I get frustrated with, with any subculture that, and I mentioned this this morning, any subculture that we can say those are the bad people that we need to ship off to an island and, uh, and and take out of our communities, and those are the bad ones. Because I think anytime we take a bunch of people and say that they're bad and they need to be eliminated, um, we're really just pointing to ourselves. Now, I'm not saying that we are all are sex offenders. I'm simply saying that I don't know that we really have a good enough understanding of what an offender is, what offenders do, what offenses are, because the media really gives us a very narrow window. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, anybody uh, not hear that story about the girl who was kidnapped when she was eight and now she's 20 and she was stuck in the guy's backyard for 20 years and living in a shack? And Okay, how long did that story dominate the media? I mean, how long was it in the media? It had to be two weeks, 10 days, something like that. You know, Nancy Gray, CNN, every media outlet, you know, this crazed sex offender who stole a girl. And of course, this is what we call fear mongering, which means playing to the worst aspects of humanity where everyone goes, oh my God, that could happen to me. And then everyone gets really freaked out about the whole thing and, it be, and, it, and then it gets lots of viewership. But the reality is, is that a snatch, a snatch and grab offender who has that kind of soci sociopathy 
is maybe, what, 5% of the total offender population? Not even. So um, even if we said 5%, that means that 95% of this troubled, problematic population is misconceived by the general public because if you say the word sex offender, everyone immediately goes to the guy who goes and steals kids and takes them to his backyard and rapes them for, you know, or the Elizabeth Smart guy, right, the guy who's with it. So that is just something that I think is worth clearing up for whatever it's worth and, you know, take what you like and leave the rest. Um, I want to give, um, just start off with a um, general clinical definition of sexual offending because um, we have misconceptions about this and uh, one of the problems is, is that sexual offender or sexual offending are legal terms. So if I am in Arkansas and I fall madly in love with a 15 year old and we talk about getting married and we start, you know, and her dad says, yeah, you can marry and we start being sexual, you know, we might get lots of gifts from friends and have a wonderful party because we're about to get married. But if I got into a sensual relationship with a 15 year old in California and I told her dad and he said, why don't you two get married, I would go to jail. So that what is considered to be sexual offending in one state is not sexual offending in another state. So it is a legal definition. Um, the only way that I feel like I can differentiate or really work with it is looking at it from a clinical standpoint. So clinically, what is sexual offending? And since we work with, at SRI, we work with people who cross sexual boundaries all the time and lie about it and keep secrets and do it compulsively, but they're not offenders, it's really important for me to have some sense when working with sexual addiction of what is offending. So non-consensual sexual behavior, very simple definition for offending. If you don't give me permission to engage in the kind of sexual behavior I'm engaging with you, I've offended you. So if I'm on the bus with you and I put my hand out and I kind of rub my hand past your butt as we're walking along, as I'm walking along, frauderism, right? I've offended you because you didn't say, oh please mister, would you put your hand out and rub your hand on my butt as we walk by? You know, if I look in your window and you didn't say look in my window when I'm undressing, I'm offending you. If I, um, if I ask someone who is not of the age to consent, to be sexual with me, then I'm offending because they cannot consent. So any time that there is not actual consent, if someone's unconscious, rape obviously, violent forms of sexual behavior are um, considered to be offending. We also add in, uh, at, for, to the clinical piece, people who are in positions of power who use that power to have other adults be sexual with them. Clergy, attorneys, physicians. So if I am, for example, I worked with a client not that long ago, who was a um, cardiologist. And he started having sex with a woman who was not his patient, but her husband was. And her husband, who he was treating, has a, had a very severe cardiac problem. He wasn't, he really needed a lot of monitoring. They were looking at surgery, heart replacement, all kinds of stuff. So here's this woman thinking, well, this, my husband's life is in this man's hands. How can she actu accurately consent to him coming on to her wanting to be sexual with her when there's a part of her who th that thinks, like in a sexual harassment case, you know, if I go along with him and have sex with him, maybe my husband will get better care. You know, or, or the woman who's working with a divorce lawyer who's thinking, you know, my settlement, if I don't have sex with him, maybe I won't get a good settlement or maybe I won't get child custody. Or, so when people you abuse power in order to invite someone to be sexual, it really can't be fully consensual. Um, we've worked with a lot of priests and um, rabbis and people of all denominations and you know when you look at someone as basically the representative of God on earth it's really hard to make a consenting uh, a, a real consent it's really difficult to consent to be sexual with them and be on an equal playing field so we look at people also who are in positions of power as uh, and who engage the people they are have power over uh, for sex as being non-consensual or engaging in a kind of offending so what is offending? Um, here's some examples. Exhibiting, voyeuring, frauderism, that's that touching stuff. The French gave us that word, thank you very much. Um, sexual harassment, incest, viewing and downloading child porn, sexual activity with a minor, rape, and we added, as you just heard me do, abuse of a professional role to obtain sex. Now, I have to say, I have done this lecture a lot of times, and this is my experience. Um, it's really hard to hear. I just want to put that out there. Like I can, it's not that I can't be succinct in the way that I speak. It's just people start hearing this information and they get lost because it's really hard to hear, especially when we get into the child issues. And 
So uh, as best you can, this is, I'd like you to see this as a fairly dry clinical presentation and keep your heart out of it at least until we get further along because it can be hard to hear. Um, um, so some common myths about sex offenders. These are the kinds of things that are promoted by the media. By the way, um, I was involved, did anybody see that show, what was it called, To Catch a Predator? Maybe not know about that show. Um, it was a television show that was designed to catch men who might have an interest in being sexual with a minor. And they set up sting operations where um, someone would be online and say, I'm a kid and I'm alone and I'm 14 and my mom and dad are away for the weekend and I'm lonely. And they'd be in a chat room and an adult male would come in and say, well, I'd like to come over, right? And then they would have these houses in Riverside or Las Vegas or New York or wherever the house was and all these guys would be lining up to go have an appointment with this underage teenager and they would end up talking to Chris Hansen, who was from uh, NBC. And I actually had the experience of being on that show because a couple of the clients who were involved in the cases here in California came to our clinic for treatment after they'd been arrested and all that stuff. Um, but my interest in, in going on the show was simply this, that the way it was portrayed, if 50 men lined up with the idea of being sexual with a minor at a house, um, the way the show was portrayed would leave you thinking that all those men are exactly the same. They're all, because they're all treated the same. They walk in, they get confronted, they walk out, they get arrested. And they all walk in with condoms and alcohol and pies and they all say, I'm not interested in having sex with kids, I was just gonna tell them not to do this, even though they come in with condoms and pies. And so my interest is in saying, you know what, if 50 people show up to do something like be sexual with a minor, um, there are probably eight or 10 reasons why emotionally, psychologically, um, physically, why s any one of those men would walk up to that house and do that. But, so my interest was in portraying the gray, you know, like there are good guys and bad guys. And the good guys are the ones who are finding these offenders and sending them off to prison. And the bad guys are the offenders. But the reality is, is that th we just don't have black hats and white hats. I mean, that's just not the way it works. That's the way it works in the media because what sells on television is good guys and bad guys. It's the same as it was in radio and black and white TV and where we are now. People want to root for the good guy and boo for the bad guy. That's just sort of how we're built, it's human nature. We don't like the complexity of the fact that a whole bunch of people may come to a bad behavior for a whole variety of reasons, which means that some of them are treatable and some of them aren't, and some of them will get better and some of them won't, and some of them should be in prison, and some of them should be locked up for a really long period of time, and some of them will never reoffend, just because they won't. How do we differentiate who those people are if we say the word offender and everyone is the bad guy who needs to be locked up and sent away forever? So my interest is in, you might call me, oh, I hate this term, an offender advocate? Ooh, I don't really feel I'm an offender advocate. I think more, I'm interested in just, I'm interested in clinicians and people in the field understanding this. Because if we don't have empathy, if we don't have some understanding for this population, then how is anybody gonna help them? And how do we change behavior if we can't have some empathy? It's not possible. So um, let me go through some myths. That's a little background of why I'm doing this. Um, so they're dirty old men. Um, I know I thought that, you know, offenders are people lying in the street or uh, in a raincoat in the park ready to molest your child. The reality is that most offenders report having committed their first sexual offense by age 16. One of the problems with offending is that we look at it as an adult crime and we don't talk much publicly. You don't hear Nancy Grace talking about the 16-year-old kids who are hurting other 14-year-old kids. But the reality is, is that children start out at a pretty, or most offenders start out pretty early in their offending behavior. If they don't get treated for that because their parents have a good attorney or um, they are in good financial status or they just get away with it, then they will become adults who offend. Um, and by the way, anyone who's interested in having a very busy private practice, because we're all interested in uh, maintaining our lifestyles these days, um, open a practice for adolescents who sexually act out because nobody wants to treat the kids. You know, nobody wants to treat the kids with sexual issues. Um, so uh, it is a place certainly in, um, in suburban America where a lot of people would be likely to come and get help even though they come in the back door and they would never uh, admit to having gone there. Um, other myths, children must watch, must watch out for strangers. Well, the reality is, is the vast majority of sexual offenders are known to their victims, the vast majority. Snatch and grab is relatively rare. Um, they are monsters. Um, well, their behavior may be monstrous, but most, law, most offenders are law-abiding, working citizens and neighbors without a prior history 
before they hit the criminal justice system, of illegal behavior arrest. So they're not robbing, stealing, raping. You know, most offenders are not, um, are not engaging in prior sociopathic behavior. Uh, offender myths, they're incurable. Well, the reality is that there are many different types of offenders. And if I just get that part out and you get nothing else from this, there are many different types of offenders. There are many different types of child offenders. So um, most of whom have a less than 10% likelihood recidiv of recidivism if provided useful treatment. Okay, so, and I'll get more specific in a minute, but out of 100 offenders, child offenders, um, we could say that if there were 100 child offenders that 15% can't really or won't really benefit much from treatment. Of the 85 that are left, mm, something like 70 of them will never reoffend once they're caught because they were caught. And um, the rest, uh, well, did I say that right? I'm sorry, I want to go back because um, I want to use those numbers effectively. Um, the person who gets caught has, is most offenders who offend have a less than 10% likelihood to repeat the offense if they have treatment. Less than 10%. And then less than 17% even if they don't get treatment. So even if they're just caught and they don't get treatment, it's highly unlikely that they're going to repeat their offense. So the idea that offenders are repeating over and over and over again, that is actually true, but just for a small percentage of offenders. So certain offenders will repeat over and over and over again. The rest of them are not going to return to it. The problem is, is that we see them as all the same. And the laws are pretty similar for everybody. So let's go over the rest of our myths. The majority of sex offenders are caught, convicted, and in prison. The reality is that only a fraction of those who commit sexual assaults are apprehended and convicted for their crimes. Most convicted sex offenders are released to the community uh, under probation or under parole. And I would venture that most sex offenders are never caught. You know, most sex offenses happen in the privacy of someone's home with someone that they know or in a school kind of setting or a camp and there is never reported and no one ever really um, goes after that person. I mean, let me ask you this, how many alcoholics? What percentage of the population are alcoholic? You know, research tells us what? Okay, but we don't know. Because how many functional alcoholics are out there? How many alcoholics are out there who drink themselves you know, to sleep every night, but they never seek treatment? They're functional enough to get by. I mean, we really don't know that. So uh, offender myths, all sex offenders are male. Vast majority of sex offenders are male, but um, about 5% of all sex offenders are also female. And I actually think that number is way underreported. And the more I think our society evolves and our culture evolves, this one, culture in particular, where women can talk about their sexual problems and get help for them, you're gonna find more and more women, and men, and also men can acknowledge that, you know, you're not a stud at age 12 if, if a 20-year-old babysitter hits on you, you've actually been wounded by that. When our culture gets to the point where men can talk about that and women can talk about sexual problems more openly, more and more of these issues are gonna be reported. Um, we see this in the sexual compulsion and sexual addiction population that more and more women are coming out of the closet with these issues. Youths do not commit sex offenses. Well, adolescents are responsible for a significant number of rape and child molestation cases each year. Um, so, what, who needs what kind of treatment and what works and what doesn't and who needs to go to jail and all that stuff? Well, unfortunately, and I think we hate this. I, I hate it. There is no one-size-fits-all treatment for sex offenders because guess what? There is no one-size-fits-all sex offender. And that's what we'd like. I mean, we want to be able to say all these people are this and they all do these horrible things and we just need to lock them up and that's that. But that is really not useful because it doesn't really match the population. The reality is that nearly every case is different in some way. So here's some ways of thinking about it. Not everyone who commits a sexual offense has a sexual disorder. For example, there can be someone who is uh, drug addicted, alcoholic, and a bit sociopathic who breaks into houses on a regular basis. And, you know, he steals for his drug habit and he doesn't really give a shit about, he's pretty sociopathic, doesn't have any remorse. And he breaks into one house and he sees a, a woman lying there on the bed asleep and he decides to force her to be sexual to him. Now, is he a sex offender? Well, yes, because he raped someone. Is, is he going to respond to sex offender treatment? Well, no, because he has no history of going after women, attacking women, raping women. This was opportunistic. 
So this is not someone, even though he may be convicted for a sexual offense, who's going to respond to sexual offender treatment. His issues most more have to do with sociopathy and compulsive stealing and drugs and alcohol. Or you can have somebody, for example, who um, has the mental capacity and emotional capacity of an eight-year-old who rides on a bus every day with younger children, but he's 35. So he is emotionally de developed at about age eight, and he spends time and, hangs time and hangs out on a van, you know, going to his daily disability program with a couple of kids who are age eight or nine. He relates to these kids. These kids are nice to him. He feels connected to these kids, but he's also an adult with a lot of sexual feelings and sexual drive, but he starts to have feelings for one of these eight-year-old girls because that's who he's spending time with. So if he makes some kind of sexual um, uh, overture to one of these children, is he a sex offender? Yes. Will sex offender treatment be useful for him? No, because his problem is not that he's a serial sex offender or that he goes after kids. The problem is that he's developmentally disabled, that he has social inhibitions and social problems, doesn't know about his sexuality or how to deal with it. He has a lot of other problems that need to be dealt with that led him to this particular behavior. But it's not the same as someone who is a sex offender, uh, who, for, for whom sexual offender treatment is going to be useful. Um, so treatment evolves from and is directly or should be specifically related towards sexually addictive, compulsive, and offending disorders. If your pathology is not of a sexual nature, treatment isn't going to work. Um, it's really just that simple. And so one of the reasons I'm talking about this is because when you look at recidivism rates or who, if, if, the, um, if we're doing research on who benefits from treatment and who doesn't, you have a treatment population and you say, well, these, this many people did well in treatment and this many people didn't, one of the questions you may not be asking is, who's in that group? And is everyone in there really a sex offender or did they, or did they commit offense, but sexual offender treatment would not be useful for them? Um, that's one of the reasons why some, much of the research we see is it can be skewed or confusing. Um, another reason, by the way, that research can be difficult is where do you think we get most sex offender research? Where does it come from? The prison system. So who ends up in prison? The most sociopathic, the most troubled, people who are the least likely to, um, to respond to treatment and also often um, have a history of recidivism because you don't get caught necessarily for that first crime. You usually get caught around the fifth or sixth or seventh time that you do something. So the people that we are gathering information from may not be the, the whole population that we're really dealing with. Okay. Um, so, now, um, if I, I run an outpatient treatment center, so first of all, we don't treat violent offenders. Um, it's not my population, but if you were in an outpatient setting like you guys, who is contraindicated for treatment? Who would not be useful to have in treatment? Who would be not likely to benefit from treatment? Well, um, if the threat of harm or physical force or violence played a role in the offense, so if someone is a, a rapist or someone is violent in their approach, they use guns, that kind of thing, they're not likely to do well in an outpatient setting, especially in initial treatment. If the sexual activity involved anything really bizarre or ritualistic, enemas, extreme bondage and violence as a part of the sexual act, they're not likely to do well in an outpatient treatment setting. If their sexual offending is a part of a larger antisocial lifestyle, like the guy I was talking about who robs and steals on a regular basis, that person is not likely to do well in an outpatient setting because the sociopathy is not, you know, part of what we use in treatment is uh, guilt, remorse, shame, bad feelings. We try to encourage people to have those feelings and understand that if they stop the behavior, they won't have those bad feelings. But sociopaths aren't capable of having those bad feelings. By the way, there's a great book on sociopathy called The Sociopath Next Door you've never read it, very, very good book. It just sort of goes over what sociopathy can, is about. And basically, um, what is described, uh, and I'll just give it to you quickly, narcissism, which some of us addict types suffer from, narcissism involves a lack of empathy. So I can be married to you and have an affair with your friend and not think about, not have empathy for how that's going to hurt you or how you're going to feel about that because I'm just so caught up in the pleasure of the moment and I have a lot of grandiosity and I figure I can carry this off and you'll never know. So a lack of empathy would be typical narcissist behavior, addict behavior. Sociopaths, psychopaths lack 
so people who have psychopathy, that's what I want to say, lack uh, empathy, but they also lack something else. They lack remorse. So people who lack remorse are incapable of feeling badly about something, which is really kind of hard for us to understand, and that's why I think the book is well read. Because all of us, I mean, I want to, uh, my hope is that all of us do have the capacity for some level of feeling badly about bad behavior. I think shame and guilt are actually very useful, because if you feel bad about something, it's a good information to tell you not to do it again, or maybe you need to clean it up. You've made a mistake, or you, but if you don't feel guilty or badly about things, how are you gonna differentiate between what is okay and what it isn't in terms of how you treat other people? You're not gonna have a, a, a guideline for that. Um, it kind of reminds me of, uh, I don't know why I'm doing this metaphor today, but um, I remember in high school psychology, they talked to us about people who, had, um, who didn't experience pain. They were born without the ability to experience pain. And the problem with that, I mean, it sounds like a kind of a good thing, you know, you'd never hurt, but you could put your hand on a stove and it would be hot and your hand would be smoldering and you might smell the smoke, but you wouldn't feel the pain. So you wouldn't know to take your hand away. When I have that affair with your best friend and um, you find out about it and I see the pain that it's cost you and I see the anger that you have toward me and, the, and maybe your desire to move away from me um, and I feel terrible about that. That gives me an opportunity to do it differently next time and to learn from that. But sociopaths don't have that experience. They just say, oh, well, you're kind of an annoying wife. I'll just find another one. You know, because they're annoyed by the problem that you create when you're upset, rather than the fact that I, feeling badly about what they've done or feeling badly about themselves. So if somebody is sociopathic and has an antisocial lifestyle, they're not going to benefit from treatment, because treatment as we know it in part is confronting distortions and challenging lack of remorse, lack of empathy, all of those kinds of things. Um, if the sexual offense is secondary to a serious mental disorder like schizophrenia um, or, uh, a, um, an, uh, or mental retardation, sex offender treatment is not likely to be useful because um, if someone is hearing voices and seeing things that aren't there, they're probably not gonna respond well to sex offender treatment, and it may not be that their offending stems from a sexual disorder, it may stem from psychosis. So those things have to be stabilized. Um, these are also contraindications to seeing someone on an outpatient basis. If the offender completely denies the offense despite intervention, it never happened. So despite working with them and spending time with them and challenging them and confronting them on facts, they say this never happened. That is a very difficult person to work with in an outpatient setting. Or if through the work they are not, they do say, well, I did that, but they can't acknowledge that it was wrong or that it caused harm or that it was problematic during the course of the treatment, they also probably aren't gonna do well in that setting because if they can't come to the understanding that there was something wrong with that, in some level, it hurts somebody or it causes damage in the future, whatever, then they're probably not gonna benefit from treatment um, in, uh, in an outpatient setting. You know, addicts often come into treatment saying, you know, I know I really screwed up and I got in a lot of trouble, but I really, I want to keep doing what I was doing and find a way to just not get into trouble. Um, that is why I think people who are in the throes of an addiction can look very sociopathic because they're so driven to use or act out in the way that they do it that they really don't, they're really not able to see or care how it affects other people. But when you stop that behavior and you confront that drug addict or that sex addict or that gambler about their behavior and how it's affected the people in their lives, hopefully that's the part of treatment is it's going to become ego dystonic because it feels bad. We want it to feel bad. We want them to recognize that it makes other people feel bad. But sociopaths don't have that experience. They are not able to feel bad. So they're just gonna to look to find a better way to do it or to not get in trouble for it. But the cultural issues around this are really profound. I mean, uh, uh, and this is not, I'm not gonna have a lot of time to go into this, but I was in Asia about a month ago teaching in Singapore about sexual disorders. And, um, you know, we're talking about compulsive behaviors and addictions and 12-step programs. Well, there isn't anybody who's gonna go to a 12-step program. And if you go to countries like that, you can go to a 12-step meeting, but everybody there is an expatriate. Everyone there is British or American or from some European country, they're not from an Asian country because Asians don't come forward generally in their culture and be in a public setting and say, I made a mistake or I have a problem because it affects their whole community, their whole family. So how do you talk about the need to own your behavior and acknowledge it and be a part of a community that is trying to change your behavior in a culture that doesn't allow someone necessarily come forward and talk about it? So yeah, there are all kinds of, and, and you can't, I don't think, and I sort of got this really quickly, I can't just say, well, you guys need to do it this way. I mean, I could, but it does, it's not going to work for them. Um, let me move on just because I have a lot of stuff to cover. Um, 
terms. This is usually when people kind of leave the room in their heads, so I just want to put this out there. Uh, violent sexual predator, fixated child offender, regressed or situational child offender, sexually addicted offender. These are the terms that we're going to cover and go over. So what is a violent offender? Well, violent offenders like that guy that you saw who snatched and grabbed that child, or the Elizabeth Smart guy who's in the news now because she is testifying against him. These are people who are the least prevalent of most offenders, but they get all the media. And the public perception is, unfortunately, that this is what an offender is. They're unlikely to enter treatment outside of incarceration, and their acts include child rape, child abduction, snatch and grab. Um, and they are less than 5% of all child offenders. So less than 5%, as you were saying, of all people who offend children are in this category, but they get the most media and the most attention because they're the most sensational. Um, now let's talk about fixated offenders. Um, oh, by the way, you're unlikely to see violent offenders if you're working in an outpatient setting. If you're in the prison system, you might be seeing them, but you're not likely to be seeing them outpatient, or at least not for very long. Um, fixated child offenders. Now, th this group is really worth understanding. Um, so, a fixated child offender is someone whose primary or sole sexual orientation is to a child. Um, that's, it's fixed, it's unlikely to change. They don't have interest in or very little interest in or arousal with sex with adults. Now this really upset me when I heard the term sexual orientation because I was sort, of, sort of thought it was insulting to somebody. You know, because if you're homosexually oriented, you're oriented to same sex. If you're heterosexually oriented, you're, entered, you're oriented to opposite sex. But if you're a fixated pedophile, that means that you're oriented to a child. So that means that the only sexual arousal you have is to someone who is prepubescent, if you're a pedophile. Well, what does that say? How do you treat that person? We sort of know we can't treat homosexuals to not be homosexual, and I don't know many heterosexuals you can treat to not be heterosexual. So if somebody truly is born this way, and that is the only thing that arouses them, how do you change that? And the answer is we don't know how to change that. So there is a percentage and, uh, of, of offenders, I think, do I have this here? Yeah. About 8 to 12% of all child offenders, they are difficult to treat. They're unlikely, the treatment success is unlikely and they have a very high recidivism rate. Well, why do they have a high recidivism rate? Because the only thing that turns them on is kids. So how do you, t basically what you have to say to that person is, I mean, can I have a heterosexual? You might be heterosexual. I can say to you, sir, you know, you can never again have sex with a woman. And you can't fantasize about it, and you can't masturbate to it, and you know, anything else is okay, but women are not okay. Well, if you're pretty heterosexual, what the heck are you gonna do with that? And that's basically what you're telling them. Now, I'm not saying that their desires are right or wrong or good or bad. I mean, their behavior is pretty horrendous. I'm just saying, trying to point out the difficulty in treating somebody like this, because there is no treatment to reorient them. Basically, the only treatments have to do with reducing their sex drive and helping them develop empathy and all that kind of stuff. Because just because someone might be, let's say, a fixated pedophile, they know from an early age that they're interested in sex with children, just like you might have had a crush on you know, your high school teacher. Um, they know that they were interested in kids, and as they age, they still have interest in those younger kids. And, but that doesn't mean they're sociopathic. So they know, some of them, that they have an attraction to children. They know it's wrong. They know it'll hurt the child. They don't want to do it. But that's the only sexual interest that they have. So what do they do with that? So they would have remorse. They would have regret. They would feel shameful and badly. But it's also the only thing that arouses them. Who, what would, be, who would be a really public example of this? maybe some major music media star who had this, you know, play parkland and had children sleep in his bed and never really was sexual with men and never really was sexual with women and, you know, this sort of uh, Peter Pan person, Peter Pan musical star, maybe you heard about him. And he would be a perfect example in my mind of a fixated pedophile because here's this person who is really no, does not have adult sexual interest but is interested primarily in relating to and being a child himself and relating to children as a sexual object or as a relational object um, as a child because he sees himself as a child. That would be very typical of a fixated sex offender. Now, so let me just get through this slide. The internal world of a fixated offender would look like this. So if I was he, him, I would, read this to, I would say this to you. My primary orientation is to kids and to adolescents. I work where I can have access to children. I become intimate with people like a, a woman because she has two young children and I can be sexual with them. This is every parent's worst nightmare next to the snatch and grab. Um, sex with adults is uninteresting to me. My orientation to children has little or nothing to do with trauma. 
I was likely born this way. So I've been aroused by kids since I was a young teenager or an adult. Another place I think that psychotherapy has gone wrong and given information to the criminal justice system that they really don't like us for um, and that has really hurt us is the idea that anyone who offends must have had a traumatic experience in childhood. And that just isn't true. You know, um, there are many people who have traumatic experiences in childhood who never offend, and there are many offenders and types of offenders who, um, who don't, didn't have that kind of childhood. This is just who they are. So in the case of this, you know, really famous musician who died recently, you know, there was a lot in the media about his father had been abusive, his father had beaten him up, he hadn't really had a childhood, he had to be an adult from a young age, and there's a lot of inference from all that. Of course, he would feel like a kid and want to be with kids. I don't believe any of that. I think that was all media hype. And I think it was very much played up by the person who had the problem. The reality is, is that probably for the time this little kid was born, he had an interest in this age and always felt that way. And his father could have been wonderfully loving and he could have grown up with plenty of high school experiences and be a musical star. And he still would have been a fixated pedophile because that's who he was. Now, why do we have these people in the genetic mix? That answer I don't have for you. You know, because there have been child offenders since time immemorial. Um, what, do they have a purpose? Why do they keep showing up? Why are they around? I, I don't have the answers to that. But um, this is not like a new experience that these people are showing up in our world. Um, so again, I want to say that that's 8 to 12 percent of, offend, of child offenders are fixated. So what about the rest of them? Okay, again, 100 guys line up at a house in Riverside because they read online that they could meet up with a 14-year-old kid or a 9-year-old. Um, who are all these people? Well, 8 to 12 of them will be fixated pedophiles. Um, Another few of them will be suffering from severe drug issues, severe um, uh, mental retardation, um, you'll have, and, and you'll have people who have severe mental health problems. But then the rest of them, the majority of them, are going to fall into this category. So a regressed or situational offender is somebody whose interest, sexual interest in children or adolescents is passing. It's temporary. It's based on, and, and it's opportunistic. It's based on their developmental immaturity, on um, their interpersonal insecurity. They feel more comfortable with someone who looks up to them, like a teenager might. Um, they, they have sexual arousal toward adults, but a child might be, or a teenager might be an easier situation to, for themselves to feel safe, or for them to feel safe. So um, we'll talk more about this. So 80 to 85% of all child offenders are of this regressed type. So who is this? Did anyone see American Beauty? Kevin Spacey, Annette Bening, who should have won an Academy Award for that role, I have to say that year. You know, that real estate role, I will sell this house, I will sell this house. You ever remember the movie? Anyway. So if you remember the movie, and you may not, it's a movie about a man and a woman, Annette Bening and Kevin Spacey, who are having severe marital problems at middle age. And he decides that what he's going to do, well, and, and they have a couple of teenage kids, and they go to a basketball game. And He's sitting there because his daughter is going to be doing cheerleading. And there's going to be a whole cheerleading thing. So they go to the basketball game and to see the cheerleading. And all of a sudden, he sees this one girl in the cheerleader line, blonde, um, in the center, very perky. And he becomes obsessed and fixated with her. And the rest of the movie, for him, is really about regressing to adolescence. He, starts, he sets up a weight, a weight bench in his garage. He buys a Camaro from the 1970s. He starts smoking pot. I mean, he really regresses. And he goes out in pursuit of this girl. Now, she's like 15 or 16. He's having a marital crisis. He's lost his job. He's having financial problems. He's smoking pot. He's just hit middle age. He's got a lot of stuff going on. His wife is emotionally unavailable and checked out, and then she starts having an affair. But the reality is that he would very much meet, um, he would be a good example of a, of a, a, a regressed or situational offender. Now, um, by the way, American Beauty never talks about him being an offender. Nobody ever really referred to that in the movie. But the reality is, if you remember the end of the movie, he gets shot and killed. So who really cares? You know, as long as he dies at the end, we don't really have to talk about his bad behavior, which is what happens. A neighbor comes over and shoots him. But this is the mindset or the inner working of somebody who's a situational offender. Grooming or ultimately seducing a child fulfills my need for recognition and acceptance and validation, um, affiliation, mastery, and control. Uh, it's not the sexual gratification or the release per se that offers me the real satisfaction in the relationship with a child. It's more that they want me. 
more that they desire me, that they're interested in me. You know, the guy who has lost his job and he's got a stepdaughter who's 16 years old and his wife has two jobs and he's drinking a lot. And he's home in the afternoon and his 16 year old stepdaughter comes home and he feels useless because he's lost his job. He feels alone because his wife is never around. He's drinking heavily. And there's this perky little 16 year old running around the house and he finds himself thinking uh, or needing her attention, her validation, her interest in him in order to feed himself. So he would say, I have a distorted interpretation of my relationship with this child. I'm sexually attracted to adults and I have sex and intimate relationships with adults, but when under certain kinds of stressors or the influence of substances or both, I have the capacity to turn to a child-teen relationship. So um, I don't have a regular history of going after kids. And like any adult male, I might find a 16-year-old attractive at the swimming pool, but I don't just try to flirt with her and hit on her and go after her. But under certain circum life circumstances, or maybe uh, even in the process of my developing re intimate relationships as I'm aging, I find it easier, more comfortable, and safer to be sexual with someone who's younger and who depends on me, because then I don't have to take emotional risks. For, you know, if I ask you out and you're my age, you could reject me. If you have a job and a career, you're a powerful figure. You may not want me. You may not see me as your equal. But if you're 15 and you think, and I, you think I'm endlessly fascinating and cool and attractive, you know, because I'm an adult and I'm interested in you, maybe I'm kind of cute, then um, I'm much less vulnerable to being wounded or harmed in that situation. I have a lot more power and control over being desired, wanted, appreciated, all that kind of stuff. Most of the offenders we see in outpatient settings engage in this kind of, are coming from this place. And you could pretty much tell um, because they have a history of sexual relationships with adults and interest in sexuality with adults. Um, and their experiences with a child have usually either been passing or opportunistic. Um, I think about it like, uh, and I tell my friends with teenage kids, I, I would never get a male babysitter. I just wouldn't. I would never do it. Um, I just think that kids are more are safer, and that's not to say that girls don't sexually act out, but five to eight to ten percent versus ninety percent, you know, and it's just males are more likely to engage in that behavior. So I wouldn't put a child or a couple of kids with a male babysitter for a long period of time. I know it's terrible, but let them go like golf caddy or you know work at the movie theater and make popcorn or something because they are more likely to act out in that way. Um, so does everyone get that most offenders um, are in this category, which means that they're highly treatable. Um, so let's talk about the psychological characteristics of child offenders. That statement, are you sure. That all males are capable of doing that no, I'm just saying that I would feel more comfortable leaving my child with a female babysitter. I just think it would cause me. I've worked with enough men who have sexually acted out. Of course, that's my skewed experience. Um, that I just think it's a safer bet to put a child with a girl. Just. If I had a friend and they said, oh, we have this great male babysitter, he's watching lots of kids in the neighborhood, I would say, find a girl. That's just me, just based on my experience, because I hear a lot of bad stories. And I don't hear them as much about girl babysitters as I do boys. Yeah, I don't know of, I don't even know if there are any fixated female offenders. I don't know of, of that history. We, we opened, um, I worked for a while with Life Healing Center, Cheryl's back there from Life Healing Center, and um, we opened a women's program, and I had a couple of female offenders come in, which is really interesting, you know. Um, where they're coming from. I'm just thinking about a woman now who was maybe in her early 50s, late 40s, and she was sent to treatment because she had been picked up, you know, she'd been arrested in her community, and they didn't know what they were going to do, but we, they sent her to treatment. And her story was, of course, she'd been serially uh, violated by a stepfather for many years, or someone in her family, and um, and as she never talked about it, never dealt with it, but as an adult, she was sort of the mama hen for all the kids in the neighborhood. And she loved being home, and she loved having all the kids around, and she actually felt more comfortable having kids around than adults. But there was one particular kid that she just had feelings about. She couldn't quite figure it out. And as he got, and she treated him differently. Like if he was, if she had told all the kids, okay kids, put away your toys and go outside and play. If he didn't, it wasn't her son, it was a kid from the neighborhood. If he didn't, she would just let him get away. There's something about him, and of course, it probably mirrored, whatever his experience was, probably mirrored some of her own abuse or her own experience. As he became an adolescent and started using drugs and all this kind of stuff, he would, he would be more and more physical with her. So he would push her, he would hang out in the kitchen and touch her, and then he touched her breasts, and, then, and she couldn't, felt like she couldn't stop him. And so uh, eventually she allowed him to be sexual with her, and then she started seeking out sex with him. He was like 16, she was like 50. 
And, you know, the reality is she was absolutely, you know, repeating what had happened to her. She really was vulnerable and unable, she felt unable to stop him. Um, she was a situational regressed offender. Um, I don't see a lot of women out there pers actively pursuing young, under, especially uh, preteen boys for sex. Uh, I don't say it doesn't happen, but you don't, it's a pretty small category. You mean testosterone? Yeah, as far as, yeah. So it'd be interesting to see what that breakdown actually is and mm -hmm. where that, because again, if we're talking about women, you know, seeking love in relationships, maybe it's just in that part versus, mm -hmm. you know, actual sexual thinking, then um, it would be interesting to see that kind of statistic, where, where they actually fall. Yeah, it's pretty small. I mean, from what I understand. I don't really, haven't run into any, but female offenders are out there and, pardon me, they do get in trouble. Um, so, typical of all child offenders, um, they experience feelings of inad inadequacy, immaturity, um, vulner vulnerability, hopelessness, and isolation. They have difficulty with assertion, as most addicts do. Um, but you can think about, you know, when I work with sex addicts, and I think this is true with most offenders, people will say to me, well, do you run into a lot of sex addicts who also engage in domestic violence? And the answer is no. because when a sex addict is disappointed in some experience in life, he doesn't go to that person and demand what he wants. He goes over here and sees a prostitute. You know, he gets disappointed in his wife and frustrated with his marriage, and he goes over here and has an affair and starts uh, going to adult bookstores. So that's a very passive response. That is not a direct response to the person uh, like an aggressive response would be. It's a much more passive or passive-aggressive response. So most child offenders are not at all aggressive in this way. You know, they're not going to be running down the street screaming at people. They're going to be very passive people who have difficulty with assertion. But guess who it's more comfortable to be assertive with? You know, a child or a teenager. So regressed offenders find adult sexuality threatening or they feel inadequate for it. Fixated offenders like that, you know, artist that we talked about, the one with the glove, um, they're really not that interested. So peer sexuality for both categories is avoided or abandoned at some point. And here's the important part, I think, just to know is that um, regressed offenders, so 85%, uh, right, uh, the American gigolo character, uh, I'm sorry, American uh, beauty character, thank you, um, Kevin Spacey, uh, they relate to that child as if they were an adult. So he is 50 years old and he's looking at this um, uh, cheerleader and he's buying her special gifts and he's treating her specially. He wants to take her to dinner and buy her a Coke. So he's treating her specially, making her feel more adult, more, he's bringing her to his level. And in his distortion, she is like an adult. She's a special child. She's so special, she's just like me, she's like an adult. So that whole Alita thing, you know? But if you're a fixated pedophile, like the gloved one, for example, you bring yourself down the level of a child. So fixated offenders see themselves as a child relating to these children as peers, whereas a regressed offender would see themselves as an adult but bring the children up to a level of being a special child or an adult. Does that make sense? Um, so that's where grooming comes in. Does, do people know what gr the word grooming means? Anybody not? This idea that I'm going to lull a child into feeling so special and so comfortable and so relaxed and so connected to me that if I move towards something sexual, it's just going to seem like the next logical step in a long-term relationship that we've had. That's why, you know, a lot of fences don't get reported is because the child you know, you spend a lot of time with me, you treat me really special, you do all these really nice things for me, we have this really incredible bond, and if it moves on to something sexual, well that just feels like part of the whole thing. You know, so it doesn't feel like a violation. You know, it's like the frog in the boiling water scenario, right? Uh, Al Gore used this in his movie about the environment, which is, you know, if you drop a frog in boiling water, they're gonna jump out, it's just too darn hot. Right, so that's the child you would approach and try to violate. But if you put a frog in lukewarm water and then you turn up the stove and it starts to heat up to boiling point, that frog's gonna die in the water because the, as the subtle temperature changes go up, the, the heat becomes disoriented and he just stays in the water. So it's very much like that. A child who is slowly approached over time for some kind of sensual situation will feel lulled and brought into a sexual relationship. That's the grooming. 
Um, and that's what happens in most of these kinds of relationships. Um, I've ruled out um, violent offenders and rapists because we don't, we're not likely to really be treating them unless you're working in the prison system. And the most likely person who's gonna end up in your doorstep are either gonna be an exhibitionist, a voyeur, someone who's out there having anonymous sex in parks and stuff and gets arrested for that, someone who's seeing prostitutes. But exhibitionism, voyeurism, prostitution, and um, anonymous public sex are misdemeanor offenses. Um, and that person will probably get their hand slapped. But I, so the, what does that really leave us in terms of the kind of people who are gonna come into treatment for sexual offending? It's gonna be child offenders or people who are looking at child porn. Um, and the child porn category, by the way, is a really interesting one because we have more and more people coming in. I mean, this is very typical. I had a guy come in recently who was, all of his life he'd looked at a tremendous amount of porn. I mean, like three, four hours a day since, he, since the internet came along. And he isn't that old, he's like 30. And he found himself increasingly fascinated by sort of, by um, ritualistic sex, bizarre sex, and, and some of the adolescent and teen and younger children pictures he was seeing. And so we started looking at that more regularly. But he really kind of lost his sense of reality because he was spending so much time, a couple hours a day, looking at porn that it all became the same to him. It was all this intense arousal process. And once you've crossed some, a little bit of shame, it's easier to walk back into that shame and walk back into that shameful behavior. So he would escalate in the amount of time that he would look at it, in the categories of the porn that he would look at, became increasingly more shaming. Eventually what happened was is that the FBI came to his door, and this is what happens if you look at child porn, and they knocked on his door and they say, hello, Mr. So-and-so, can we have your hard drive, please? We know what you've been doing. And they come in and they take your computer and they take your laptop and they say, we'll be back when we decide what we're going to do with you, and they leave. That's what happens if you're looking at child porn. So, and usually they come back in about six or eight months and they arrest you but they let you sit there waiting to figure out what, and that's usually when people come into treatment because they're like, oh my God, what did I do? I need to get some help, all that kind of stuff. Um, but these are people who um, I think more belong in this category, which is one that has very little exploration or discussion. And I'm sorry, what is, what is your name? You? Kenya. Okay, Kenya and I were talking before we were getting started and you know, about this idea that um, there's addiction treatment and 12-step recovery, and then there's sex offender treatment, which belongs much more to the criminal justice system. And they don't really meet. You know, the criminal justice folks really aren't real big on 12-step recovery or the idea of sexual addiction. And the um, sexual addiction folks, they don't want to be identified with offenders. And the, um, the problem is, is that if you have a lifelong vulnerability, okay, to some kind of problematic sexual behavior, Who's going to do better? The person who goes to see a therapist and gets really good treatment and maybe they go to jail and have some kind of punishment and then they are on their own? Or the person who goes to jail and has some kind of punishment and maybe has some kind of treatment, but integrated into their treatment is the idea that for the rest of their lives there's a place they can go to meet with other men on a regular basis who don't want to do this behavior, like a 12-step meeting. Because treatment is what? Two years, four years, whatever. Prison is two years, four years. But you can go to a meeting the rest of your life. So the idea that there could be this relapse prevention tool or support for you is, I think, a big part of why, hopefully, there'll be more integration between these two areas. Has anyone ever experienced this, some of the conflict between the sort of recovery community and the um, uh, criminal justice community? Uh, I'm not going to weigh in on what's right and wrong. I'm just going to say that there's a lot of disagreement and discomfort in those two communities. And it seems to me it would be a no-brainer. Part of the reason, well, it doesn't mean, it doesn't matter. I won't even get into it. So there's this category of people that we think about 50 to 75% and we don't know of all offenders, whether child offenders, rapists, exhibitionists, voyeurs, all offenders, have some um, experience of compulsive or addictive sexual behavior. And these are, by the way, most of the people that we treat at SRI up in LA, is we treat people who are compulsively masturbating where they're out porn, they're exhibiting, they're voyeuring, they're seeing prostitutes, they're going to massage parlors, they're having anonymous or public sex, they're going to strip clubs, they're going to adult bookstores. I think we had that one twice. They're hooking up online repeatedly for anonymous sex, cyber sex. Whoops. Um, so hold on just a second. So those people, whoops, that just doesn't want to go that way. Sorry. So the, the thing is, we don't really know much about these people. Um, sorry. 
because there's not a lot of research about sex addiction in general or compulsive sexual behavior outside of the prison system. So, for example, we have a clinic that has maybe 100 people a week or more, depending on the week, coming in for sexual disorders treatment. We get offenders in there sometimes, but ones who've never been reported, never been arrested, but there's no research mandate on those populations. So people who engage in compulsive sexual behavior, even if they cross the line to offending, we have no research, we have no information about those people. We have information about the worst of the worst, the ones in the prisons who've been you know, repeatedly in the prison system, but we don't have information about people who are compulsively sexual in their lives and may occasionally cross the line into offending. So. Um, let me talk to you about the inner world of these people, and this is the majority of the people that we see in our outpatient setting. Um, I'm very narcissistic, I'm sensitive, I'm easily hurt, um, even though I may appear driven or outwardly competent. Think, I don't know, Dave Letterman, Elliot Spitzer, Bill Clinton, perhaps. Um, my fragile sense of being lovable and worthy of love is less threatened by casual sex. Let me say that again, my sense of being lovable and worthy of love is less threatened by casual sex um, than by an intimate par partnership. It's safer for me as a sex addict to risk arrest or disease or other losses through repetitive sex with anonymous partners or prostitutes or pornography or sexual massage than to risk threats that are less controllable like emotional abandonment. In other words, being emotionally intimate is very, very scary. I would rather have arrestable sex at least I can control that. It's very hard for a prostitute to hurt me or make me feel abandoned. It's very hard for me if I'm in an intense romantic affair where that person just feels locked into me to feel like I'm gonna lose them because they're so powerfully emotionally connected. I'm not really worried when I'm looking at a lot of pornography about whether I'm gonna feel left out or unloved or not cared about. But to go to my spouse and really be intimate both physically or sexually, uh, physically, sexually or emotionally if I'm intimate with people that I care about and I've made myself vulnerable to, they can hurt me. And sex addicts will go through all kinds of sexual and uh, intimate looking experiences, but the reality is they're not really making themselves vulnerable in any way that they could really feel loved or connected, so they're empty all the time. Um, so, sex, so, for sex addicts, sexual acting out is reliable, it keeps my focus in fantasy, which is exciting, distracting, and safer than taking the painful risks that getting close to another person can bring. I do, if I'm a sex addict, I do desire healthy intimacy, I do have primary relationships, um, but um, I choose to live a double life of hidden secrets and isolation. This is most typically a sex addict. Um, these are the people we see in treatment. Sex addicts use intensity to substitute for intimacy. They also use intensity to distract themselves from emotional experiences that they don't know how to tolerate. So they have affect management problems, they have self-stability and self-awareness problems, and they distract themselves with intense sexual experiences so that they don't have to deal with the day-to-day -day stressors of life. So this is uh, more than likely, if you, don't, if you just treat people, treat people with sexual issues, this is who's gonna come into your office. What is responsible treatment with offenders? And you guys, um, the things I'm asking myself when I make a referral, when I accept a client, um, who has an offending history, when I find out somebody has an offending history or might be an offender, one of the things that I have to ask myself is what is the likelihood that this person is going to continue to commit sex crimes? You know? And if they have a high likelihood of re-offending, re is this the right setting for them? Um, or wherever I'm sending them or putting them? Because I don't want them to re-offend. I don't want people to come to harm. Under what circumstances is this person least likely to re-offend? You know, where do they need to be? Where are they going to get the most containment and help? What can be done to reduce the likelihood of reoffense? Um, that's our job. So, what kind of treatment works and doesn't work for whatever we know about this with an offender population? Um, well, there's chemo, there's uh, psychopharm, psychopharm, psychopharm. Chemotherapy is not the right word. It's psychopharm, but it is chemicals, right? What is psychopharm? It's um, drugs like Depo. They are. Um, and I don't know if I can say that word, anti androgenic can anybody say that for me? They reduce male, in essence, they reduce testosterone. So they reduce sex drive. So this is the, one of the only things we know how to do with a sex offender. It's basically uh, chemical castration, which is we take away the sex drive of an offender, someone who's specifically dedicated uh, to offending children, so that they no longer desire sex, period, because that's the only thing we know how to do with them. What's wrong with that is that 
where is our primary sex organ? It's between our ears, not between our legs. So you can, and they used to do this in the 19th century, they used to literally castrate people, and they would still find them going after children because it isn't just about the sexual act, it's at the pursuit, the pursuit, the involvement, the excitement, the, the, the affirmation, the validation, the connection, all those emotional kinds of things. I have, um, I have a friend who is a fixated child offender in the field. He's a researcher and a, and a professor. He knew from an early age he had an interest in young children. That's always been one of his primary interests. What he wanted was to get married and have a family. So he um, used his sperm to have uh, children with his wife, and then he went on depot. He weighs about 350 pounds. Most of the people that I know who know him say, oh my god, will that guy ever stop eating? What they don't know is he doesn't have a compulsive eating problem. He's on depot. So he is living his life as a responsible person. Um, he's a professor. He's in this field. He does a lot of research. Um, he does treatment. Um, but he has eliminated his sex drive because he is willing to do that in order to not offend a child and live a life like the rest of us, more or less. So I, I think it would be presumptive to say that that everybody res would respond to a particular thing. My guess is if somebody's violent and has the tendencies, they're going to be violent and have those tendencies on depo. Um, that's just my response to that. Um, so the only people that you would probably use psychopharmacology with related to hor hormonal reduction would be a fixated offender, because we don't have any way of treat other way of knowing how to treat them. Um, behavior mod, strict behavior modification. Um, it has to do with conditioning and learning principles. You all studied this in grad school. I hated this stuff. Isn't it really boring? But it basically, it's, aver you know, it's Pavlovian, right? It's aversive conditioning. So what they do is they take, they break uh, like an ammonia capsule and they put it under someone's nose at the same time they're showing them a picture of a child. So um, what it does, is supposed to do, is pair aversive feelings with those images. Uh, in the 70s, by the way, and I remember this, when I wanted my parents, I was a kid and I wanted my parents to stop smoking, and they had these stop smoking programs. They showed them on TV, I think I remember seeing them on the news, where if you were a smoker, you could go to a clinic, and what they would do is they would lock you in a small, well, they put you in a small room that was basically glassed in, and it had a giant ashtray, and they'd give you two packs of cigarettes, and there was no ventilation in the room. So, and you were asked to smoke the two packs of cigarettes within an hour or two. So you would sit there for hours and do nothing but smoke, and then you had to inhale and smell the ashtray and all this kind of stuff. You had to do that for a series of days. This was behavior mod for smoking. Um, it didn't work, but it looked really weird to see these people in these rooms full of smoke and inhaling ashtrays and all this kind of stuff. But it was based on the same principle, was it, which is if you pair a miserable experience with, hopefully, with this what had been a rewarding experience, that the person will no longer want the reward because they'll immediately think of the negative stimulus at the same time. Um, unfortunately, it's minimally effective because the result of it extinguishes over time that, you know, any of you who've been through a crisis or a loss know that the immediacy of law, or anyone who's worked with an addict who got arrested or lost a job or a spouse, and they said, oh my god, I'll never do this again because look at this terrible thing that happened. And then six months later, they're back to their behavior. It's because pain doesn't, short-term pain doesn't necessarily change a, 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 a life of, lifetime of behavior. So just because you pair something painful, negative, problematic with a, a, a problematic behavior, it doesn't mean that they're, that's going to remain paired in their mind. So it's fine as long as they're breaking ammonia capsules under their nose, but within a reasonably short period of time, it's going to wear thin. Unfortunately, this is still used, I don't say unfortunately because we don't have a lot of answers, but I think about a third of the prisons in the country who do treatment at all still use aversive conditioning as a form of treatment. Um, but I think what it does teach people is if you act out in this way, you could go to jail and people will stick ammonia under your nose. And if you don't want to go to jail and have people stick ammonia under your nose, don't do this. You know, that, that message kind of gets across. Um, so, um, ooh, did I skip a slide? Hold on a second. I want to tell you. Oh, okay, yeah, I did. So, uh, other modalities. Psychodynamic psychotherapy, what most of us studied in school. You know, talk therapy, sit down with a therapist, talk through your problems, talk about your past. Um, has proven the least effective towards change. It's either minimally or non-effective. So every therapist out there who says, well, you know, when we talk through what you went through with your family, or then you're going to stop this behavior, doesn't work. It just simply doesn't work. So um, if you have an offender and you are a psychodynamic psychotherapist, please refer them out 
because this is, even if they have family trauma and they have issues, and it's not going to learn, help them learn the tools they need to learn to not do their behavior. So what is left? Well, we have COG-B and psychoeducation, which views, views most sexual offending to be a, a, the, what is the word I just used? I'm sorry. To be the product of, develop, of develop, developmental problems and the attempt on that person's part to remedy such problems. So we do re-education, re-socialization, we confront denial, we confront their defenses. I mean, this is what treatment's about. It's very similar to what you do in addiction treatment, only you're doing it with offending. Um, the aim is to alert the offender to the life issues that stress him and help him find ways of reducing these stressors so, and being aware of these stressors and giving him better coping skills than sexual arousal or using sex as a means of coping. We teach self-observance, we teach about sexual compulsivity, we teach about the recognition of characteristic early behaviors or triggers or warning signs. It's chemdep, it's treatment, it's what you do. Empathy, by the way, is a later stage part of this process because uh, first, they have to stop the behavior first, and then they have to do relapse prevention and COG-B, and then eventually they might get to how it's affected the people in their lives. Um, so sex offender treatment is educational. It's, um, I'm not going to go through, it's experiential uh, in terms of confronting experiences in group. Um, so I'm trying to think if, what I really want to get to you guys with. I guess our expectations of treatment. So what is the goal? What am I trying to get to in doing offender treatment in an outpatient setting? Well, number one is I want them to move from having the experience of offending be syntonic, meaning sounds good to me, let's go. You know, egocentonic for me would be I know there's M&Ms downstairs and they're going to taste really good and I'm really going to enjoy them and I can't wait to get downstairs to have some M&Ms. That's egocentonic. Ego dystonic would be, do you know how fat my thighs are? <laughs> do you know that I can barely fit in the nice dress clothes I bought last year? And I've been working out and exercising, and if I go downstairs and eat those M&Ms, I'm probably going to feel really terrible about myself. So you know what? It doesn't feel, even though it initially kind of looks interesting, I actually think it's a bad idea to go downstairs and eat those M&Ms. So I've taken something that was ego syntonic, woo, M&Ms, let's go downstairs, to making it ego dystonic, which means it's still appealing, but I really don't want to do it. I understand it's not a good thing for me. And that's what we want to do. We want to take the, oh, it feels like a really good idea to you know, open my uh, pants to someone as the, they're driving by to, you know what, this is a really bad idea. And I don't think I should be doing this, even though it feels good and I want to do it. Um, we want them to recognize their sexual problems through knowledge of their symptoms. You know, when you find yourself, you know, it isn't when you are uh, with sex addicts. It isn't when I'm sitting with the a fair partner or in the massage parlor that I'm in trouble, it's when I'm thinking about it. You know, three days before when I think, oh, my wife's gonna be out on Friday night and maybe I could stop that by that massage parlor or, you know what, maybe I could just, you know, it's getting dark earlier and as I drive home, I notice that people's lights are on. Maybe I could do a walk with a dog tonight early and look in a few people's windows. When I have that thought, that's when I need to go get some help, not when I'm already out with the dog. And so we want them to see the, to, to have knowledge of their symptoms. We want to, them to admit to their problem, you know, talk about all the behavior. Um, we want them to accept responsibility in some way uh, for what has happened and what they've done. We want them to see it as inappropriate. You know, you may want it, you may like it, you may enjoy it, it's not appropriate, not okay, not what adults do in this culture. Now, these are ideals, you know, I don't know that I'm gonna get this far with everybody, but this is the goal. You know, I've had clients come into the clinic and say, I can't believe you, you shame me, you make me feel bad. Well, yeah, because that behavior when you were doing it, that was bad. Most people would feel bad doing that. You didn't feel bad, that's a problem. I want you to feel bad about the behavior. So the difference between I feel bad about that, that was a really bad thing, I don't want to do that again, that hurt other people, it ruined my life. That's healthy shame. Unhealthy shame is, I'm such a piece of shit, I'm such a horrible person, no one's going to love me now, I'm, un I'm, un I'm horrible, I deserve to die. So that kind of inward self-hatred, shame spiral, narcissistic sort of flagellation is not what we're looking for. So when I hear a client, when I'm challenging or confronting a client about their behavior and I hear them move to how horrible they are, you know, the reality is I can't help them with that. If they're really just a bad person and they're going to see themselves that way, I can't really treat bad people. But if they're good people who have a problematic or bad behavior, I can help treat that 
And part of that treatment is helping them to feel badly about that which they didn't feel badly before. Did I say that right? Wow, that was all those like L-Y words really just kind of. So, um, and, and by the way, pe the sex addicts are often very narcissistic. So they will jump into, I'm so horrible, I'm so terrible. I'm, but that doesn't really give consideration for how it affected their kids, their family, their wives, their lives. That's really where I want them to go. I want them to feel badly for the people in their lives and the bad situations they've created. I don't want them to feel badly for how terrible they are because I can't work with that. You know, all I want them to do is simply look at what happened. And we have all kinds of ways to do that. I mean, we ask them to, for example, we'll ask them to write out their most recent offense. You know, and then we'll ask them to write it out like the person who experienced it, like the child. Then we might ask them to write it like as in a third party way, like as a newspaper article. Man was seen walking down. We want to give them every opportunity to look at it so they can really get a picture of what is it that I did and what is it that happened and how did this come and how do other people look at it? And because they're not in that place. Um, they don't really have that understanding. They only see it as they see it. Um, and when you confront them on it, they just move to hating themselves, and that's not useful. Does that answer your question? Um, um, and by the way, people come to therapy and they say, oh, well, I, you know, I didn't come here for you to make me feel bad. You know, I thought you were going to support me. I thought you were going to nurture me. I thought you were going to be cohesion with me. I mean, I thought that's what therapy's about. Well, it is what that's about if you're going in because you're depressed and you had a loss. It's not what it's about necessarily if you've been acting out and you've been arrested. Um, there's a, um, I'm going to get back to that in a second. So we want them to realize it's path pathological. We want them to acknowledge that they have to gain some kind of control, and I use that word hesitantly, over how they live. Um, because they may not have control over this behavior, but they can have control over how they live. In other words, if they know that, that they um, that they shouldn't leave, go to certain areas, that they shouldn't act in certain ways, that they, shouldn't, that they need to take care of themselves emotionally, physically, spiritually. Um, in other words, they know that they have responsibility for not allowing themselves to be vulnerable to acting out. Um, easiest way to say that is HALT, which is what they use in AA. You know, we have to teach them that it's not, maybe other people can be hungry, angry, lonely, tired, but if you have a history of when feeling vulnerable, impulsively acting out sexually in ways that hurt people, you can't do that. You have to take better care of yourself. Um, so we're also teaching them how to live. This is a really good statement about working with addicts, and I think what the work is in general um, with this kind of population. Um, I work with a lot of interns and trainees, and they come in to do to train with us, and they have a very psychodynamic, you know, supportive, nurturing, relational background. And that is a very appropriate way to work with someone if they're voluntary. You know, if they're coming in to see you and they're like, you know, I have this thing in life and I want to work on it, or I can't seem to find a boyfriend, or I'm angry at my husband, or my child died and I just need support, those are voluntary clients. Addicts and offenders are not voluntary clients. They come in because they got arrested. And if they don't get treatment, something bad's going to happen. Or because their wife said, if you don't get some help, I'm going to leave you. That's not a voluntary client. Now, they may come in and say, and they often do, oh, you know, I just want to get better, and I've never wanted to act this way, and I really hate the way I've been, and blah, blah, blah. And then I just sort of sit there and say, OK, but why are you here? Well, I just never wanted to hurt people. I never, but you did it for 20 years. Why are you here now? Well, my wife said, well, the police officer, well, my parole officer, oh, OK, that's why you're here. You don't want to get any more trouble. OK, great, that's really helpful. So now you are, in my mind, an involuntary client. You're here not because you really want to be, but because you want, you have to be. So when we treat involuntary clients, we treat them differently. And these are some great statements, I think, about thinking about this. When working with involuntary clients, treatment is compulsory, and so traditional appro approaches have to be adapted. Um, number one, we exercise control over the client in a responsible fashion, which means if someone's not complying with treatment, I might call the parole officer. If I have a client who is not really focused and um, giving to the process, I might ask him to invite his wife in and then say to her, I'm concerned about you and your husband because your husband's not really acting, you know, really taking advantage of the treatment process. So I'm, because I, I don't have a lot of control over him necessarily, but I bet she does. So exercising responsible control and authority over the client. I am also um, in a position to confront and control, which means I'm confronting the, uh, their distortions, their bad thinking, their problematic, and I'm also giving them suggestions. Go to 12-step meetings, or read this book, or go to group, or uh, maybe controlling them is not, a better, is not the right word, but it is prescriptive. 
You know, it is saying you have this problem and you're coming here because you do these things and here are the things you can do to get better and then watching and seeing what they do. Now, the psychodynamic part, I think, and the interesting part to me is that everybody's different. So some people will come to treatment for a sexual disorder or an addiction and they will be completely compliant and they'll do everything they need to do because they really want to get well. Unfortunately, that's not most of them. You know, most people come to treatment and they are, show their resistance in a variety of ways. You know, some people will just sort of be superficial and half do the things you give them. Some of them won't do them at all. Some of them will do them late. You know, some of them will not pay on time. Some of them will show up late. And all this stuff has to be confronted. And it has to be confronted really early on. Because my goal is to say, you know what, I see you. You know, you're not fooling me. You're not hiding. You're not keeping secrets. I get where you're coming from. And I'm concerned about you and I want to help you. So I'm going to contain, I'm going to put a container around the way you're acting here. It's not okay with me that you come late. It's not okay with me that you don't pay on time. It's not okay with me that you don't do the homework. And there's something very psychodynamic in that because I can also turn around and say, and I'll give you just an example of this and then I think we need to stop. Let's say I gave an assignment of something to work on to a non, to a voluntary client. Okay? And they come in and they say, you know, I looked at that assignment, I just didn't want to do it, I was really depressed and unhappy. And, you know, I might say to them, well, what did it mean to you that you got this assignment? Or what came up for you when you thought about doing it? Or how did it feel to you when I gave you the assignment? Or, you know, that might be a typical sort of psychodynamic response to explore, you know, what it meant to them and why it was, what it felt to them. But if someone is an involuntary client or an, or an addict or has, is coming in because of behavioral disorder, and I ask him to do something, we have an agreement that you're going to complete that assignment or you're going to show up on time or you're going to finish that, then when they come in and they haven't done it, well, I know this person has a history of not meeting agreements for a really long time. You know, they're violating the law or they're violating their relationships. So I can say to them, you know what? It's really interesting because last week we, we agreed that you were going to complete this assignment. And it's really, I'm curious that you didn't do it because you came in and you said you really wanted help. And I'm saying, and I said to you, here's one of the ways you can get help once you start on this assignment. And then you didn't do it. And it's kind of frustrating to me. In fact, I wonder if this is maybe how your wife feels when you make all kinds of promises to her and then you don't follow through on them. You know, are, is, do you want to be the kind of person that people don't have trust in? Do you see yourself as someone who doesn't follow through on commitments that you've made? So basically, in a non-angry, non-threatening way, I'm throwing the reality of how they behaved um, right back on them for them to look at. That, to me, is good treatment in a sense because we have the structure, which is the cog B, the assignments, the homework, the work that goes on in the room that we're bringing, the readings. But everything that they do and the ways that they act is, this, is the psychodynamic part. It's what every, what, um, um, and the resistance is an opportunity to look at how they act in relationships and how they try to get away with things and all that kind of stuff. So um, the two pieces actually do come together if you're doing good treatment. You're not just saying to someone, read your assignment, okay, you read your assignment, okay, you read your assignment. You know, you're looking at how they approached it, how they did it, all of that stuff is grist for the mill because that's how they, you know, that's how they act their lives out and that's how they try to get away with things out there that they think no one's going to notice. But in treatment, we notice and we pay attention because that's our job. So anyway, I, I'm done um, with this. Um, I think. If you, if you find yourself in, an in a situation where you might have the opportunity to work with a sex offender and you haven't done that before, it really can often be a rewarding experience. And um, the problem is I often really like these people and I really hate their behavior. And when you get to like a client and you start to abdicate for a client, you have to really watch out for the fact that they may be really friendly and warm and loving and you think you have a great client and then they'll go right back to acting out. It has nothing to do with the relationship in some way, at least for them. They don't feel like it has anything to do with the relationship. Um, okay, a couple questions and we'll...